Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. Brett Lloyd is a 57-year-old who has been a carnivore for five months. Brett has improved almost every aspect of his life with a carnivore diet, including adding muscle, curing anxiety and insomnia, and transforming his mental state to become re-employed. I'm very excited to have you on the show today, Brett. Welcome. Thank you so much, Scott. It's a real honor to be here. Um, Your podcast has really been a great source of information. I've learned so much about so many other things that I never imagined. Uh, For instance, I didn't know that in England, uh, body organs is considered a normal part of the diet. I mean, animal organs is a part of the diet over there, whereas over here in America is very different. These are great things that, that you pick up that enhance the journey. Yeah, that's great to hear. I really appreciate it, Brett. And, um, you know, I think everyone's story is valuable and, and hopefully a lot of folks will get value out of this too. I'm sure they will. Um, so can you just take a little bit of time to tell listeners a little more about yourself, Brett? You know, where do you come from? Um, what do you do for a living and maybe how, how you found carnivore? Uh, I'm originally from Huntington, West Virginia. Um, a uh, little background there, uh, working class family. Uh, my parents had an enormous vegetable garden. I had fresh vegetables year round, uh, either straight pick that day or canned. We had potatoes year round, but we also had plenty of meat. There was, there was no vegetarianism. It was just the standard American diet. And I got through that fairly well, uh, by being an athlete. And so I didn't suffer too much, though, when I was the summer between my fifth and sixth grade year, I got hit by a car on a bicycle. And my parents report years later that uh, I went from this really happy, fun kid to be around to this sour, angry, annoying, uh, less than pleasant creature that they had to deal with every day. But I was obviously at that age, I was oblivious to that. and I, to the present, to fully answer your question, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a musician. I performed live for many years, uh, but due to mental illness, depression and whatnot, I stepped away. I couldn't, I couldn't function well enough to, to continue doing that performing live, but I continued to write and record and produce albums, uh, on the internet which I still do today, but I'm also gainfully employed again. So things are looking up. Um, Growing up, I uh, was very active. We ate well. Meat was a part. There was also snacks and whatnot, but cakes and things were special. They weren't a constant every day, you know, eat a bunch of sugar, even though we were, we ate cereal. My mom and dad didn't know better. Uh, fast forward, looking fast forward, I uh, was diagnosed with major depression in 1990. Um, I'll take a few minutes to explain what depression means for me because it's very different for everybody specifically. Um, for me, depression, I was very dissatisfied. I was a very angry person. I could not process data. Uh, I have a theory. It's my theory, a guitar player's theory, if you will. Uh, mental illness filters everything we see, everything we hear, everything we touch. All our inputs from the outside world are warped, nudged, changed, altered in some fashion. Uh, a great case in point, my wife would say on some morning, it's a beautiful sunny day in a very positive, uplifting, like, hey, man, it's a beautiful day. But I, that's not how I would translate it. I would, my ears would pick up something in her tone of voice to suggest that, yeah, it's a beautiful day. 
So I was constantly misperceiving everything. Uh, in, interacting with somebody else became very difficult because I couldn't process what they were saying. Not to mention, it became increasingly difficult for me to express myself in a way that persons who were not suffering from mental illness could understand. And it created this cycle, this circle of constant frustration, because if you can't communicate with anybody, but you want to, it becomes this incredibly horrible experience. And it creates conflict out of nothing. Um, and I lived like that for the better part of 25 years. I was first diagnosed in 1990. Um, I was started using antidepressants in 1995 with some minimal success. I would have what I called the cycle of wellness, the cycle of illness. I would have these periods where the meds would work really well. And then I would have two or three months where they stopped working. And when they stopped working, I got worse. And this went on for years. Finally, the doctor started changing and adding different cocktails. I mean, I was on, if you look on my Facebook, there's a picture from 2013. And there's, I have all my meds lined up in a row. And there's like eight different medicines, um, all changing my brain chemistry. And none of them really did much for very long. Um, was on things like Symbiax. I eventually got Effexor, Lexapro, Zoloft, Latuda, Lamactyl, Seroquel, Symbiax. I may have mentioned that twice. I was on that for a while. That was lovely medicine. You slept for 16 hours a day and the conscious hours you were not, it was not a good time because I felt like a lump. If you ever saw the uh, movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that medicine literally made me into Danny DeVito's character. So it was not a fun time at all. Um, in 2007 and 2008, I, there, due to a family thing, I had your basic old fashioned classic nervous breakdown. I didn't sleep more than an hour or two for two months on two separate occasions. Uh, the anxiety got ramped up. I, uh, I found that if I just going to mass and if you're familiar with the Catholic mass at all, we, we tap our chest as part of admitting that we're sinners. And I was getting so overweight due to the meds and the poor diet and everything that I actually was convinced I was going to give myself a heart attack by doing that. That's how out of whack my thinking and feeling was um, it, it was horrible and you can't process anything good when you're like that. It's anything positive. Just it's like, there's a shield. It just keeps it all the way. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm cutting out huge chunks here for, for brevity and I want to keep it focused by the one thing that, that I did find pleasure in, not surprisingly, is sugar, cakes, pies, ice cream, grapes, grapefruit, bananas, apples. I crave them like you cannot imagine. And for those brief periods of time, I would feel almost okay while I was eating that. So in addition to gaining weight, which is a natural thing that happens to people who are on antidepressants, psychotropic drugs, mental health meds in general, you're going to gain weight almost always, unless you're fortunate that you have the energy to want to do things. I didn't have that. From 2000, okay, uh, I did have a, a year of 2009 to 2010 where I did get better and Scott it's really fascinating to me in a I didn't put it together until after I learned about carnivory but I incidentally started a low carb diet because I didn't like the fact that I was wearing 38 inch waist pants 
And I went on the Atkins version of the low carb diet and I lost some weight. I also started feeling better, but I didn't put the two together because my thought processes weren't clear enough to make the connection. And of course, no doctor, no psychiatrist, psychologist, uh, nobody suggested to me that changing my diet could possibly improve or have an impact on my mental health in any way. So I, I didn't put it together. Anyway, for that year, I stuck with the Adkins for about six, seven months and was able to go to my 30 year class reunion. You can see those pictures. I look like I I look like I'm in good shape. I'm not heavy. I lost maybe 30 pounds, got down to around 230, which for a guy that's six, one, six foot and a half inch, (laughs) got to have that half inch. Uh, You know, that's not a bad weight for me at that time. It was great. It was wonderful. But then uh, Ju- July of 2010, and again, I mentioned mass because it's a Sunday evening. I'm at mass by myself. And it's right before consecration and we're on our knees praying. And suddenly I get a red alert feeling in the core of my being that says you need to go home and you need to go home now. And I literally ran out of the parish. Just, And if anybody knows me, that's just so atypical. It's beyond the pale. And I couldn't understand, but I had just this insane urge. I had to get home. Fifteen minutes after I get home, my wife's like, what's wrong with you? I'm on the couch, curled up in a ball, bawling like a baby and have no idea why. From that moment until January 15, it was just a nightmare because the frustrations just got worse exponentially. The anxiety increased exponentially. The cycles of wellness decreased dramatically. Uh, We also moved to where we live now in the Jacksonville, Florida area. So I had to start with brand new doctors and whatnot. And down here, they tend to want to give you a pill before you even completed your second sentence. And so there was different cocktails of meds, Abilify with Seroquel with Lamactyl and all this madden. And my brain chemistry was in constant state of flux. It was no, it was never not being altered by a pharmaceutical medication. And naturally, I got worse. Um, The intake of sweets increased. Uh, I got heavier to the point that January 2015, I weighed 289 pounds. My psychiatrist was telling me, that I should seriously consider electroshock therapy and or a long-term hospitalization, neither of which was doable because, A, there was no way I was ever going to allow electroshock to uh, happen, and I didn't have health insurance, so no no hospital was going to accept me for long-term care. Enter a dear friend, a music friend that I work with. You've actually heard her sing. You listen to that song I sent you the link to. Um, Kimmy Wade, bless her heart. She mentioned to me that I should look in to medical marijuana. Now, it's an important part of the story here because this is where things start to get better. And I, as a musician, I was not unfamiliar with cannabis, but because I had a bad experience with it when I was very young, it was not my thing. I was the guy at all the parties or after the show, before the show, during rehearsals. I passed it on. It just wasn't for me. But I took her advice. She was very serious and explained some of the anecdotal evidence that's out there. And and I did some searching and my wife and I concluded, what did we have to lose? So she secured four grams of flour and made cookies with it. And Scott I was so, these cookies were only, they were oatmeal cookies with raisins. They were the size of a quarter, very small little thing. I was terrified. I only ate a half of one the first time because I was afraid I was going to have a bad experience. 
15 minutes after I ate that cookie, I felt like a thousand suns had lifted off my body. I was not high. I was not intoxicated. I just felt good. And when you haven't felt good for years and you suddenly feel, I'm not, you know, this is pleasant. It's a mind boggling experience. 30 minutes later, a slight high kicked in and I felt joy for the first time in many years. It treated my symptoms. It did not eliminate the illness. It just treated the symptoms. And here's why that's important, because about a week and a half after this, and I'd started using it, and, and I was just a little bit better, not a lot better, but a little bit better. And I was tying, trying to tie my shoe one day, and my belly was in the way, and I caught myself feeling extremely uncomfortable and short of breath just from tying my shoe. And I'm like, this is crazy. I can't. How did this happen? I was completely unaware of the physical state that I was in. I mean, I knew I was big, but I had no idea I was like that. That's how the filters work. The mental illness filters deny you information about yourself. It's really bizarre and, and, and terrible. So I immediately looked at my wife that morning and I said, this has to change. And I, I immediately went on back on the my understanding of the Atkins diet. And I started a walking program. And I was only walking a block here, a block and a half there. But I made sure I did it every day. And slowly but surely, weight started to come off. And I still hadn't made a connection between what, uh, my mental health and my diet. But over the next couple of years, three years from, from February 2015 to June of 2018, I lost 99 pounds, low carb walking, no weightlifting, no running, just walking. Um, and I started feeling a lot better. But I still was dependent on cannabis and I didn't like that because cannabis, even here in Florida, it's legal. I, I'm a legal patient, but it's very expensive. And I just did not like the fact that if I stopped using it for a week, I'm right back where I was emotionally. That was just unacceptable to me. So I was always on a quest for another solution. This same lady that recommended that I look into medical cannabis messages me in April and says, you got to watch this guy named Jordan Peterson. You're going to love him. And it was a video about from one of his lectures. And to say the least, he, he made an impression on me. And all I'll say about Dr. Peterson about his lecturing is he articulates things that I have felt for years, but was unable to articulate. Anyway, so I started watching his videos and what do I run across in the month of June? But Jordan Peterson on Joe Rogan, somebody had chopped it up and it was a 30 minute thing where he described how his daughter healed herself of depression and arthritis and that he had done so as well just by eating meat and drinking water. Well, <laughs> If it had been anybody else but him, somebody that I have great respect for, that I believe has incredible integrity, if I had seen anybody else's testimony, I probably would have thought it was crazy. But because it was him, I had to investigate it. And that investigation led me to Sean Baker's podcast on Rogan, which I probably have watched 50 times. And so... You know, and then I start bringing my wife into this and I'm like, what are these people talking about? We've got we've got there might be an answer here. And then I ran across a talk that Amber O'Hearn gave in 2017 about how we as humans separated ourselves from 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 the animal side and how we evolved 
by eating meat. And bit by bit, bit by bit, the puzzle was put together in a way that I could comprehend. And I looked at my eyes and I got to do this. I can't not try this. So July 16th was the day I started. And I weighed, I think maybe 190 then, 192, something like that. Uh, and I had a lot of body fat. Oh, there's a before picture that nobody's ever going to see because it's not a very, very pretty picture. I mean, I've lost a lot of weight. I've lost almost 100 pounds at that point, but I still have just an enormous amount of body fat everywhere. It's not a pretty thing. Um, July 29th, as a carnivore, I clicked over and hit the 100-pound loss mark, which was pretty exciting. And I could already tell, like day 10 of my carnivore experience, I didn't know I had joint pain. I, I had aches and pains that I didn't associate with the inflammation I didn't associate as something unnatural. I thought that was just the normal way you felt by living that long. I woke up on the 11th morning and all my joint pain, Scott, it was gone. It was gone. I mean, I'm walking through my house like a 10 year old who just got up from, from, from his morning breakfast or something, bouncing around, ready to go. I never experienced anything like that in my life. My lower back had suffered. My L4, 5, and 6 are slightly out of whack due to genetics. My mom, I get to thank her for that. Thanks, mom. I could suddenly, I used to have to, to sit in special chairs and things like that just to alleviate the discomfort. And walking long distances, well, that just wasn't possible because my back would start hurting. Well, the next thing I know, Scott, I'm walking 20 miles a week. And my lower back doesn't hurt anymore. And this is by just by day 15. And I noticed that I don't need to use as much cannabis to maintain a positive mood. On day 23, I know something's happened because I'm suddenly just exuberantly happy. And I'm like, well, now, is this just placebo? Am I just, you know, am I setting myself up here? You know, let's, 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 let's be, let's be rational about it. But as the day went on and I found I didn't need to use cannabis at all to maintain my mood, I was getting really excited. And then into day 24, I was convinced completely. All my symptoms, depression symptoms are gone. I didn't need, I didn't have to use anything anymore. And I still get a little emotional about that because that's a glorious day I'll never forget. To be free of that horrible monster, finally. I used to describe depression to people. <clears throat> and when you're unable, when you're having trouble articulating anything, trying to describe something as profound and insidious as depression becomes a real challenge. And the best way I came up with was to describe it as an anvil. A 50 pound anvil that I wore on my head like a hat that I couldn't take off. And that was how I lived every day. So if you can imagine with a 50 pound weight on your head, it doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how great a will you have. You will get worn down. And I'm free of that because of carnivory. That's amazing, Brett. Thank you so much for, for sharing that story and, and being so generous, um, and transparent with, with everything you went through. I can't imagine some of the pain you went through and, uh, the mental struggles and physical struggles and the effect it must have had on, on your life, your well-being and your family. Um, I really appreciate that. And, uh, I'm curious. You know, you said you had experimented with low carb and with Atkins. Did you see some of the relief of your symptoms of depression and um, arthritis when when you were going through those spells? Or was it only once you went carnivore that you had uh, a more noticeable symptom relief? Well, first off, I don't know. I was never diagnosed with, with arthritis. I just had aches and pains, what I would call characterize as aches and pains. 
Now I know it was joint pain. Do I, did I have arthritis? I don't know. I, I was never diagnosed. Uh, but to answer the rest of your question, I, my thought processes, my ability to perceive things was still so warped by the illness when I initially went low carb that I wasn't able to equate, I wasn't able to even perceive that as the, the low carb being a contributor to my improved mood at that time. I wasn't able to make that connection until earlier this year when I, you know, when Dr. Baker explained carnivory in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in the way he did, uh, the way other people have explained it, I was able, I was able to look, I'm able to look backwards and understand it better than I couldn't understand anything while it was occurring. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. That, no, that makes a ton of sense. And, um, it's so fascinating to me, the change in your mental state. Um, I, I, you know, you see the physical transformations and the weight loss and the reduction of joint pain, other autoimmune conditions, GI distress all the time with, with carnivory. I think the most shocking is the mental transformations. It makes sense to me now that I understand the science, but just intuitively, that the way you're eating could influence your mood and the way your brain works uh, so directly is, is really remarkable. How do you think about that? And, and just, can you talk a little bit more about your personal experience and why you think it, it shifted that way? Well, I, some of the science I grasp, some of it is beyond me. I basically boil, I keep it simple for me. It, it's, you know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage experience. Um, you know, I'm trying to th- I have to be careful. I don't go off on a tangent here. Um, for me, the longer I experience it, it's like I'm being rebuilt from the inside out. In- physically, emotionally, mentally, um, I'm able to process data at, 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 in a normal way that, and, and that sounds really strange, but when you've been unable to for years and suddenly you can, you just don't develop what I call happy skills instantly. So I'm, I'm, I'm still in the learning healing process. Um, and I haven't fully come to conclusions on why certain things are happening, but it, I cannot deny that cognitively I'm at a much better rate. I had an instance. I used to actually work in the mental health field in my twenties before I came, it used to be a running joke before I became a patient of the mental health system. I was an employee of the mental health system. Um, so I understand how some of the dynamics and, and how a lot of this works with mental illness but it seems to me that our body's ability to repair itself is inhibited when we eat anything other than meat, whether it's from the toxins in plants and the grains that inhibit nutrient absorption, plus all kinds of other pathology that comes from that that's injected into the body that accumulates over time. It's really amazing that we do this to ourselves. And, and let's face it, we did it out of ignorance. Nobody, no, who ration, what rational person drinks a gallon of bleach or something? Nobody does that because it's poison. So if you don't know this stuff's bad for you and you being taught your whole life, a balanced diet is the way to live, then you don't look at that as a cause for your inflammation, your mental illness your autoimmune disease, your metabolic, you don't look at that. That's not an, because we're not trained to look at it that way. I mean, you know, I think and look at the misery that would have been averted had we just known about this a hundred years ago. Can you imagine? We're eating soy. Soy in 19, in the early 1900s, soy was considered a manufacturing oil. And we're putting this into our bodies. People are selling it. We're giving our hard-earned money to eat this garbage. 
again, I have to be careful here. You had a question, and I don't yeah. know if I've answered it. No, no, <laughs> that's, that's great, Brett, and it makes a ton of sense. I just find it really interesting to, to hear the anecdotes and to hear how the experience changed for you. And can you talk about how after so many years, you know, you said in the early 90s was when you were first kind of diagnosed and started taking antidepressants, the switch flipping so quickly, what did those around you, doctors, family members, friends, what did they think of what you were doing? And, and did you try to spread, um, you know, your message of success to those around you and how did they react? I spread my message everywhere I can every day because I think it's very important for those of us who know what it's like to have no hope, but find not just hope, but a viable working solution that not only gives hope, but leads to joy. I think it would be a crime not to share that. And I encourage everybody in carnivory who's living this way, if you've healed yourself and you've gotten better, share your story. Now, to be more, to answer the specifics of your question, um, my wife was hopeful, but she was like, we've tried everything and so many things have failed, we don't know. But she was so convinced after the first month, she became carnivore. Uh, she's got osteoarthritis in her shoulders. She's got arthritis in her hands. Her shoulders, after just four months, are pain-free completely. And her hands, her fingers were already starting to draw up and get discolored. And her fingers are straight again, and the discoloration is almost completely gone, and she has almost completely full range of movement again in her hands without any pain. In four months. Wow. And they told her that it was only going to get worse because it was due to the type of work she does. Motion caused. Repetitive motion injury. But she no longer experiences any discomfort whatsoever. And has lost 20-some pounds in her own right. And she looks and feels amazing. And a quick anecdote about her. She was notorious for... Waking up very grouchy, very hateful, not very pleasant to be around until she had her first cup of coffee. So when she would get up in the morning, I immediately would escape to my studio room until I knew she had her coffee because she was not fit to be around. And she would tell you that. She was not shy about it. It was like a badge of honor for her at the time. And then one morning after about the third week of her living carnivorously, I love that word carnivorously. She uh, came out and just started talking to me in this pleasant, happy tone. And she sat down and we had this five minute conversation. I looked at her and I said, you haven't had your coffee yet. And she said, I just realized that. Wow, what a change. So it had even impacted her that way. She wasn't suffering from any mental illness, but it cleared her up. For me, the brain fog vanished. It's just mind boggling. You don't know what brain fog is until it's gone. Yeah. My my parents, my mom thought I was just um, another, okay, this is my son who has mental illness being himself until she started seeing the pictures because that's where she could tell the difference. And you've seen my before and after picture. There's no doubt that guy on the left, <laughs> that big, heavy guy with the beard and the grumpy, angry, sad, drugged up face is not in a good shape. And the skinny guy on the right with the great big smile is, is just beaming with joy. My mom appreciates that. And that's when she started sharing information about, well, when you got hit by the car, we noticed this. These are the, you know, you don't know these things and, and, and it, it all matters. I'm not making sense here. Bear with me. I still no. have, I still have brain farts once in a while. You still <laughs> short circuits. I tell people to look at me as a myriad of relays. And for decades, a lot of the red lights were on and a lot of the lights were just off. And with maybe one or two, you know, the heart still beat, the brain still operated, kept things flowing. So those were on. Those were the green lights. Well, now you can look at me and you can see a lot more green lights than red. And there's a few yellow lights and almost all the lights are working now. So I've progressed to that point. Uh, my friends, 
initially thought I had lost my mind again. They thought I got all kinds of messages. Are you okay? Are you, you know, you haven't had another spell or you haven't fallen back in the ditch, whatever phrase they wanted, you know, that came at me. And I'm like, no, this is real. I really do feel this good. Um, and then I discovered uh, the carnivore community, not just on Twitter, but on Facebook, zeroing in on health and, you know, people like Amber O'Hearn. And then there's uh, Kelly Hogan, whose story to me is just incredible. I could listen to her talk about her experience forever just because it's it's so relatable. And she didn't suffer any mental illness whatsoever. She just dealt with the weight side of it. Uh, but I, I finding a home in that community has encouraged me that much more to share my story with people because there's a lot of hopelessness out there, Scott. I know you're aware of it. A lot of it's in our own families. It's with our friends that we love and care about who just aren't open to the idea that eating meat by itself isn't crazy. You know, we've all seen those memes of of the Joker, you know, and a steak and a, a bowl of lettuce is considered an appropriate meal. But you take the lettuce away and suddenly everyone loses their minds. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, it's the truth. Yeah. Um. And I see people, I show people my picture, my before and after picture all the time. And the first question is, is how did you do it? And usually that picture is my hook because it's hard to argue with that. And they will at least listen to me. And I try to explain, I don't start, well, I just eat meat. I, I start, you know, I only eat animal source foods. And that seems to to be more a more palatable way of explaining it rather than just saying, Hey, all I do is eat meat and drink water. Cause if you say I eat, I eat meat and dairy and eggs, then people seem to be a little more open to that in my experience. Yeah. But overall people look at me and they see my affect is very happy. I am laughing almost all the time, Scott, I have to be careful. Sometimes I'll be walking and in a good mood and I have to, I'll start chuckling to myself and I think I have to be careful. I don't want people to think there's a crazy man laughing at himself walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a glorious change and, and it's, I've just barely scratched the surface. When we see people like Joe Anderson, he's 60 years old. He's been living this way since he was 40. He looks like he's 35. Now, I don't, I'm not holding out hope that I'm going to wake up one day and look like I'm 35. But when I'm 60, I, I expect I will feel at least this good, if not better. And, and gosh, who wants to change that? <laughs> not me. Yeah, me either. I'm so happy to hear that, Brett. And congratulations on your success and your wife's as well. It's, it's one thing to, to change your own life and transform but it's a whole nother to inspire others. And, and that must have made you feel um, incredible to, to be able to help her in that way and help her experience those mood and energy benefits, um, as well as healing her osteoarthritis and, and losing some weight as well. I'm, I'm very impressed by that. And, um, you know, you talk about uh, introducing it as an animal food based diet. Um, or a protein based diet to folks, um, when you, when you're trying to talk about it to not alarm them at first. Uh, but I'm curious for, from your own perspective and personal experience, you know, you've been doing this for five, almost six months. Um, and a lot of people with different conditions react differently to introducing sort of carnivore adjacent foods. Have you experimenting with adding certain things in, taking them out? you know, dairy, eggs, um, other other things, coffee. And have you seen any of those affect your mood in, in one way or another or, or other symptoms you may have experienced? I have no interest in experimenting, and I'll explain that. To me, this gift that I've been given is so precious. I mean, most people, let's face it, people who suffer from depression for more than 20 years, most of them are dead, if not by their own hand, heart attacks, 
it, it's common. People with mental illness generally don't live as long as people without. Um, so I'm not going to take the risk. I stick my carnivory for me is is right now beef and bacon. I have some fish. I have pork once a week. Um, and and water, and I am perfectly content with that. I enjoy every meal. I get excited about every meal. Um, for every every for lunch and breakfast every day, I have eight ounces of ground beef, and I have six to eight ounces of bacon. That's I always use uh, different brands from breakfast to lunch for a little taste variance. And then dinner is at least 12 ounces of meat, preferably some form of steak. We usually buy London broil and my wife cuts that up and then we have a smoker and she'll smoke it. And it's really good. Um, and I'll have another six to eight ounces of bacon. My wife also makes a lot of bone broth. I'll have bone broth every day, at least one or two. And every evening I finish off my evening snack is more bacon and bone broth. Um, I still use cannabis primarily to sleep at night. That helps a great deal, though I'm sensing the need for that is diminishing because this month I've strung together some seven, eight and even one nine hour nights to sleep together for the first time in years. So that aspect has improved greatly as well. I just don't feel a need to tinker with it. Now, I see people that tinker with it and they're looking. My wife doesn't eat like I do. She eats. She'll eat some cheeses once in a while. She'll eat some yogurt once in a while. She finally gave up coffee. And it's your podcast. Uh, we had anecdotal man on. And he started talking about coffee and arthritis. I was like, she has to hear this because she would not give up the coffee for love and her money. Until she heard that. And so thank you for airing that. And thank you to Annie Doman for sharing that because now she's coffee free and she's seeing positive results from it. I never drank coffee, so I didn't have that demon to deal with. Well, I'm not, I gave, I used to drink a lot of tea, uh, barely sweetened, kind of strong, but I gave that up two years ago just because it just didn't see any need to keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to tinker. I'm, I'm, I know in time, my body will say, you need to eat a different kind of meat. And when that happens, I'll make the adjustment. But until then, I'm staying in pat because I'm, 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 I, I lowest, my lowest weight as a carnivore, it got down to 173. And I'm not going to lie. I got a little nervous because I was like, I don't want to go past 170. I'm starting to look a little twiggish. And when you have somebody, I basically sat in a chair for 10 years. Basically, that's what I did prior from call it 2010. Well, from 20, let's say from 2010 to 25, a five year period, I just sat in a chair and let my body atrophy. So when you took all the fat away, there wasn't a lot left. <laughs> and I'm doing light resistance training. I've been very, have to be very cautious because, uh, I have a hernia history that I do not want to repeat ever again. And so I was very aware of how weak I was at the, once the weight was off, even from all the walking and whatnot, I still muscular muscle wise, it's very weak. Um, so I'm doing light resistance training and a lot of isometric type kind of stuff. And I, it's paying off. I'm up to 177, 178. Now my waistline has not budged, which I love. And the sky's the limit. I mean, I barely scratched the surface. I'm five months in. You know, you have people like Charles Washington has been doing it for 10 plus years. Amro Hearn's on 10 years now, I believe. They report increased gains in health and mental clarity as time goes on. So I'm excited and, and I see no need to make any alterations. Yeah, I can completely understand that when you've searched for so long for a solution and experienced so much hardship and challenge and finally found something that works well for you, uh, thanks to your own initiative and searching and willingness to self experiment, um, you know, stick with that. I think that's, I think that's amazing if it's working well for you. And Brett, 
um, you know, would love to just, I, I really appreciate you sharing your story. You know, you talked about how you think it's so important to, to spread the knowledge you've gained and share the story if it inspires someone else. And I'm the same way. I'm not an evangelist for the carnivore diet, despite having a carnivore podcast, <laughs> but I do, I do like to share what I've experienced and what I've seen from others in the hopes that it'll encourage others to dig into the research more self-experiment and, and try to see what's possible. Um, what advice would you give to, you know, someone who's in the position you were a year ago, a few years ago, really struggling um, to, to close out the show? Don't give up. Do not give up. That's the best, best advice I can give anybody suffering from mental illness. You don't give up. I was blessed that I had my faith and my wife who's if, if anybody's earned a spot in heaven, she did for putting up with me. Believe me, uh, people who live with mentally ill family members suffer horribly right along with them. Uh, she'll tell you straight up. It was like li she lived on eggshells because she never knew what to expect. But do not give up. Do not give up. I mean, in big red letters, do not give up. There is yeah. hope. There is hope. Eating meat and drinking water sounds extreme, but for most people who are suffering, what you're doing isn't working. Give yourself a chance to try something different for just 30 days. I mean, they don't want you to try medicines for 30 days. They, you know, they would give you these pills and come back in six months and let us see how you're doing. To try carnivory for 30 days for a chance at being free of your mental illness to me seems like a worthy risk. And I encourage everyone who's suffering from whatever, if you've followed your doctor's orders, you've taken the medications, I don't care if it's for arthritis, multiple sclerosis. Uh, speaking of which, I have a, a lady I, I knew from when I grew up with contacted me on Facebook after she read some of this. She's got a type of multiple sclerosis that supposedly doesn't go into remission. And she re reported an enormous improvement in her symptoms and an elimination of many of her symptoms in just three months. That can happen to every one of us, every one of you out there listening, if you just give it a try. And there's no cheat days. There's no... But you won't want them because after about 10 days, I stopped craving everything except meat. No sugar. I don't want sweets. You couldn't pay me to eat it. Yeah. So don't give up hope. Just don't quit. Don't give up. Give it a try. For 30 days, you could put up with it. You put up with depression for 20 years or diabetes or arthritis. You're suffering. You can try this for 30 days. I know you can do it. And please give it a whirl. Yeah. Great advice. Don't give up and give carnivory a try. I would echo that. And it means so much more coming from you and, and your experiences, Brett. Um, where can people find out more about you and, and um, follow along with your journey? Uh, I'm on Twitter at Stickman Bleeding. I'll spell this out. It's S-T-I-C-K-M-A-N-B-L-E-E-D-I-N. That was my stage name was Stickman for years, and my music solo musical thing is Stickman Bleeding. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at thankful.carnivore. I do post it. There's a lot, some before and after stuff. There's a lot of pictures of me as a carnivore now. Uh, my proudest picture, Scott, is me wearing 32 inch waist pants again. <laughs> That's great. That I'll was, definitely link to all of that in the show notes, Brett. Thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate what you're doing. Please continue with, with what you're doing. I'm not a zealot either. If you could live happy eating some other way, by all means do it. But please take care of yourselves out there. Yeah, it's a great perspective. Thanks again for your time, Brett. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to sharing this with folks. Thanks so much, Scott. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. 
What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.